everyone and welcome back to part two of lecture four. So now we're coming into ecological management concepts. And our first concept is looking into coarse and fine filter approach. Now coarse filter is a metaphor to express the idea that by conserving the ecological communities of a given region, the majority of the species will be conserved. So in order to understand this metaphor, put in mind example of uh, a marine protected area. So if you're looking at a marine protected area, um, you're obviously not only looking after the ecosystem, but you're conserving all of the species that are found within that conserved area. So that is what the metaphor is about. So in order to implement the cross filter, it refers to the management of the landscape through a network of protected areas and management practices in the surrounding matrix that attempt to emulate and conserve naturally ecological processes within the natural range of variability. So in other words, in order to implement the cost filter approach, one has to look at how the landscape is going to be managed, number one. Um, of course, in implementing of how many protected areas there should be and what are the management practices, meaning to say, uh, what are the organizations that are going to be involved, who the rangers are going to help out with this, uh, those kind of things in terms of management. Now, the fine filter approach uh, is a metaphor to express the idea that some species, ecosystems and features, need to be conserved through an individual localized effort. Okay, um, so an example is a species of conservation concern. When you mean by conservation concern, usually it falls under the category of IUCN red list that relies on a particular habitat feature within an ecosystem for survival, that the feature is not normally conserved by cost filter approach. Okay, so for an example here, uh, this is a perfect example of the cost filter approach where we're looking after the overall uh, Albertine Rift Montane Forest. So by, by doing this, you're conserving all of the species that are found within. But now the filter approach is, out of the say 100 species, this is going back into... Uh, the point about um, viability, okay? There are some species that are able to withstand a certain threshold, a certain pressure. But there are some species that are not very easily able to adapt to certain environmental changes. And that is why they need the, fil the fine filter approach, meaning to say we need to have conservation measures which helps, looking at, after example for the mountain gorilla, or the uh, Johnston uh, chameleon, or the Grower broadbill. So if you're looking at, say, with uh, marine protected areas, example. So marine protected areas, of course, you look at into, uh, look after into all of the different species. But there are certain species that requires a bit more help. Say, example, like the green turtle, the recovery of the green turtle, or the hawksbill turtle, the fact that our um, leatherbacks have actually gone extinct, at least within Malaysian waters. So... Our efforts now are to help to try conserve, to revive the numbers back to any um, programs with regards to helping to revive the numbers of, say, the sea turtles or any other conservation efforts with WWF, etc. So this is where the fine filter approach comes in. All right, so now we come to the second part, which is risk in an inherent aspect of decision making or basically uh, risk management uh, decision making processes okay so risk is an inherent aspect of decision making meaning to say one really has to consider risk decision making so given the complexity and variability evident in concepts one so concept one was about levels of biological organizations uh concept four was about population viability or the threshold that i was talking about or how how well it can survive Number five is ecological resilience, meaning to say uh, once pressure is put onto them, how are they able to recover back? And number six is the disturbances. So risk assessment out of the different seven concepts we talked about, it heavily looks upon these four uh, concepts. So, uh, but because of the complexity of that, meaning sometimes it's really hard to predict or look into certain things. We can never be quite certain of the consequences of management actions. Yes, because sometimes we overlook things or we didn't expect we, that could happen. So risk is the potential for loss or damage resulting from a particular action or decision. Now, the risk assessment looks into two 
elements. One, the likelihood of the event occurring. So with risk um, is, okay, we are aware this thing has happened before. So what is the likelihood of this happening again? That is one. What are the risks that you have taken? What are the risk measures that you have taken to prevent this from happening? Now, the second part is, if no matter what circumstance, it is definitely likely to happen. What is the magnitude? What is the impact? How great is the problem of the consequence should this event occur? It's meaning to say, in some ways, this is unavoidable, but how great is the impact? So we really have to look into all sorts of risk, okay? So risk management is the process of weighing the assessed risk against the expected benefits to make the best decisions, okay? So in a way, it's a form of prediction. But this prediction, of course, is based on observable events that has happened in the past and how we don't want it to happen again. Uh, but remember how it looks into disturbances? But disturbances also, there's two kinds, the natural disturbing kind uh, or those that are of human intervention. So, example, if a volcano eruption were to happen, okay, and one, um, so you want to look at in terms of the ecosystem of where that, um, of where that volcano is. What are the risks that you want to look into, especially if there are different, if there are housing areas in that a in that area. So, what what do you want to look at? How you know all of these aspects needs to be looked into. Uncertainty is a directly uh, is directly related to the risk, of course, because um, the fact that you're uncertain, certain things are going to occur, and that uncertainty is one that is able that does occur. It becomes a risk, of course. Um, so, so these are things that one it's more of a prediction tool that helps us look into all sorts of consequences and what we can do. The what we can do part is the adaptive management. So again, risk is looking to all those details, those problems that we have, and how do we adapt to it. So the systematic, uh, so this management is a systematic learning process that formally plans and monitors the outcomes of decisions to improve our ability to better manage natural resources given uncertainty. Okay, so you see how this is actually quite linked to this. Because here you're sort of having creating a list of all possible uh, problems to come. And actually, this is something that you might actually apply later when you're doing environmental impact assessment. So maybe something that you can all quite relate to is um, the forest city um, controversial aspect when build, reclaiming land in order to create housing developments uh, there for forest city. Okay, how did it affect the seagrass aspect here? What were the risks taken? So um, then it's, okay, there was a bit of a controversial thing there because obviously it adapted the ecosystem, yada, yada. Um, and then what are the adaptive management uh, processes to take place? So the options to improve decision-making with the incomplete knowledge uh, include, because don't forget that there are things that we will not have knowledge of, okay? So sometimes it's a trial and error thing, okay? So sometimes the damage is done, so what can we learn from this? And which initial choices are the best guess, okay? And then passive adaptive, where one model is assumed to be correct. So sometimes we assume it's correct, we will never know until it actually happens. And the adapt active adaptive one is where the multiple alternative models are linked to policy choices. So this one is very likely to occur, and this is where the implementation of the policy takes place. Okay, some of the policies that we're talking about are looking into ecosystem-based management. So EDIS is defined as an adaptive approach um, to managing human activities. Okay, you see how the process is very good. I mean, it was sort of a flow. First, you're looking into all the different risks based on what you know and what is likely not to occur. And then what are the adaptive management programs that we are going to likely to occur? And don't forget, because you have some that are trial and errors, you're learning from your mistakes, uh, some are the passive approach, and then some where it does occur, and then what are the policy choices that you want to make? So this is pretty much one of it. Um, so it is an approach to managing human activities that seeks to ensure the coexistence of a healthy, fully functional ecosystem and human community. The intent is to maintain those spatial and temporal characteristics of ecosystem. 
such as the component of species and ecological processes can be sustained and human well-being supported and improved. Okay, so EBM is not necessarily place-based, but also takes into account two opposing value systems. Uh, so it's not necessarily focused into one particular aspect, but it looks into an overall uh, aspect of looking in, into the intrinsic ecosystem, which is what occurs naturally in the ecosystem and what is essential in it, plus the value of humans. How does it benefit humans without having to overexploit it? So um, this one, if you, if you notice, it's looking into the different ecologic levels of ecology. So one is, of course, we humans use fishes as the main source of our food. Okay. Um, so if it is a single species aspect where you're looking at, there's a different policy that, has, that looks into it, um, which is the fishery management of the fishes uh, for plan. Okay. Fishery management plan for this. Uh, if you go at a different level, so you have the ecosystem approach to fisheries management, and then you have an ecosystem-based management. So, uh, and then of course you have to link in different scientific bodies to help, uh, you know, engage into your risk assessment as, as well as all the different adaptive management. So you're looking at a higher level of um, uh, base management. Okay, so this is where it is. Um, I've gotten this picture through uh, a link on future ocean observations to connect climate fisheries and marine ecosystems. So you can actually check out what policies do they implement from a single species level to a higher trophic level. And then, of course, there's something that you can all relate to, which is a protected area. It refers to an area that has some form of protection and typically has minimal human footprint. So ours is not... Uh, Birung Island is not particularly considered as um, a marine protected area. It's considered a research station, but we do try to limit the human footprint. So example in British Columbia, they would include all sorts of federal and provincial designated parks and protected areas, as well as many areas that are managed primarily for biodiversity. So example includes national wildlife areas, wildlife management areas, riparian reserves, etc. Um, in our case, other than having the marine protected areas, we have reef checks and all to always ensure the management of these works. Okay, so some private lands protected through acquisitions or agreement would also qualify, and the protected areas are often the core and cost filter approach conservation. So, we it's if you want to go about it, oh, let's make a uh, Vietnamese settlement, uh, the Vietnamese uh, sorry, Bidong Island as um. A cost filter approach, MEP, okay, uh, MPA, sorry. So, in order to do that, one will be asking you in terms of what are the kinds of organisms that they're looking after. Why? Why is there a need to actually provide a, a marine protected area if that's what you're fighting for? Um, and what sort of species are considered under IUCN regulations? Those are the drives if you want to actually uh, provide a core and core a cost and fine filter approach for conservation. Protected areas can also be used as fine filter purpose to protect a population that is quite rare. So again, if you're able to find new species that is rare, sometimes there's also a category in the ICN regulations where is, um, data is insufficient. However, it might have a very important ecological role that it plays that is not yet discovered. So the potential of Venturing into all these different areas for policy making, etc., is very big, and I think one should really explore this. So then, also you're looking into providing connectivity and to serve as benchmarks. So you wouldn't want an island to uh, to be very isolated from each other and fragmented so much so um, the diversity is such that they can't live in unison. And also is to help provide a research and educational background for different opportunities. All right. So this is part two of um, my presentation and we look to part three into principles of ecology.